Okay, could I ask people to uh, to find their seats? Okay, folks. Uh, you know, if, if we had to pay him what he's worth, we couldn't afford the billing hours. So I want to get started here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, delighted to have you here, and it's a, really a great privilege to have General Bolden with us. Uh, first, let me tell everybody, you know, if, you, if you've got a cell phone, put it on silent sun, stun, because if it rings, I'm going to walk over and haul you out, because we don't want the interruptions. Um, this is a, a real privilege. Uh, on a personal level, I've had the, the privilege of working with General Bolden through a number of years. Uh, we served together back at DOD. He was, uh, he was still in uniform at the time, serving so ably in the, in the Marine Corps. Um, and, uh, and then I thought he deserved his private life, and he did too for a very short time, uh, but then was called back into into service with, uh, with my President Obama uh, and to head up NASA. Uh, I, I think it takes a combat-tested Marine to be the administrator of NASA today. Uh, these are tough days. You know, we've got, uh, we have expectations that are enormous, we have budgets that are constraining, and we have, uh, you know, foxhole to foxhole politics in Washington. This is going to be hard, but uh, I happen to know General Bolden, and he's absolutely up to this challenge. Uh, he has such a, a, an embracing personality. Uh, you know, he combines what I always have admired in the Marine Corps, you know, uh, a charming personality, but willing to fight r literally foxhole to foxhole to get his mission accomplished. And, and uh, it's going to take that this year, Charlie. It's going to be a tough year. But uh, because of his, his spirit and his, and his energy and his courage, I, I feel fairly confident that uh, we're going to prevail. We, he has an ambitious technical agenda for NASA, uh, coming at a time when, uh, when the government feels it's broke. And one of the great challenges that he faces, of course, is to reinvigorate that sense of excitement that uh, those of us that are sitting around here that have gray hair remember that. A lot of the others don't, you know, but the, I can still remember those days, how thrilling it was. We just were glued to the television to, to see John Glenn go in orbit. You know, you got, you're too young, you can't shake your head up now. You're too young, you can't remember that. Maybe you saw the movies, uh, you know. Uh, but you remember that. You remember that thrill. And unfortunately, that thrill and excitement isn't with us now, so it's a harder story to sell to the American public that an active space program is still an important national objective. But it is. And that's General Bolden's responsibilities now. So we're fortunate to have him here. Uh, I will tell you, I'm sure he's here to enlist all of you in helping him this year. And we should, because this is what's going to be all of our responsibility, to try to bring this forward and make sure that in this turbulent environment that uh, the prevailing good that we see in NASA and in this program still is able to survive through a tough year. And so with that, General Bolden, we look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, General Bolden. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Amory, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation, but, but most especially thanks for the very gracious introduction. I do not deserve that. Um, there is a person I want to acknowledge here, and she is a dear friend and, um, and a recent occupant of a, a room in the astronaut office in Houston, and that's uh, Julie Payette, who is back here in the, in the middle section. So, Julie, thanks so much for coming out. Um, I had the privilege of welcoming Julie home, seems like yesterday, but it was probably a year ago. I don't know. How long ago? Two years ago. Was it really? Oh, man. Well, I guess I'm having too much fun. But, uh, but I, I do thank you for coming, and I thank all of you for coming out. And I, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to, to, uh, to exchange a little bit as, before they give me the hook and pull me off. But um, when President Obama said in his State of the Union address that he wanted our nation to out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build the rest of the world, we at NASA knew that we knew exactly what he wanted. It's the kind of philosophy, sort of what uh, Dr. Hamry talked about in his introduction. 
It's the kind of philosophy that has always driven our thinking and our missions. It's what got us to the moon. It's why we have the world's most advanced fleet of Earth observing satellites. It's why so many of our exploration technologies have successfully made the transition from NASA to the private sector and your homes and businesses. In this fiscal year 2012 budget request for NASA, the President addresses all the elements of our strongly bipartisan Authorization Act of 2010, which sets us up on a path to create new technologies to win the future. This budget requires us to live within our means so we can invest in that future. It maintains our strong commitment to human spaceflight and new technologies. It establishes the critical priorities and invests in excellent science, aeronautics research, and education programs. At its core, NASA's mission remains fundamentally the same as it's always been, and it responds to our new vision to reach for new heights and reveal the unknown so that what we do and learn will benefit all humankind. But now we carry out this mission with a renewed commitment to focusing on what we do best while engaging America's innovators and entrepreneurs as partners in our journey. What the President is talking about is a renewed commitment to the energies and expertise that we already possess and a charge to bring them to the next level. And that innovation will help drive our economy through the creation of high-tech jobs and breakthroughs that today we can't even imagine. America is the nation we are today because of the technological investments made in the past 50 years. Our lives have been greatly improved by directing sp 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 scarce resources toward exploring space. Knowledge from weather spacecraft, efficiency improvements in both ground and air transportation, biomedical applications such as blood flow monitoring devices, implantable insulin pumps, pacemakers, and Lasix eye surgery, and the protective clothing and air breathing packs that keep our military, firefighters, and police safe are all derived from our nation's investment in exploration. NASA's space technology makes a difference in our lives every day and can be a spark to an economy that is becoming more technology-based over time. NASA's successes, and yes, even its failures over the past 50 years have inspired countless people to pursue science, technology, engineering, and mathematics careers, and the outcome of NASA's endeavors, both in technology, and, in technology advancements and intellectual capital, has transformed our world. NASA's renewed focus on innovation and technology is vital. By investing in high payoff disruptive technology, that industry cannot tackle today, NASA matures the technology required, required for its future missions in aeronautics, science, and exploration while proving the capabilities and lowering the cost of other government agencies and commercial space activities. Consider for a moment how the architectural options for human space exploration of our solar system will change when reliable commercial access to low Earth orbit propellant depots, inflatable habitats, and advanced in-space propulsion technologies are available. For our science missions, consider the improvements possible from new optics, lightweight materials, structures, and power systems and high bandwidth communications. Consider the efficiency gains in radiation shielding and closed-loop life support systems that may become possible from improved human knowledge and human, of human adaptability to the space environment gained through scientific experiments on the International Space Station. The President's fiscal year 2012 budget funds a diverse array of human spaceflight programs that maximize our use of current capabilities, such as the International Space Station, facilitate innovative approaches to ensure U.S. leadership in low Earth orbit, and position us to explore the frontiers of deep space. Taken together, these initiatives will enable America to retain its position as a leader in space exploration for generations to come. To do this, we'll need to transform the way we do business. We'll need to be innovative, creative, and agile, adapting to rapid changes in technology and business practices. By transforming the way we do business, we can help ensure that our nation's space program is affordable, sustainable, and realistic. Realistic does not mean less exciting. 
NASA's chief technologist, Bobby Braun, who's sitting right here on the front row, and you'll get to hear a little bit from him uh, when the panel comes up. Um, he's going to tell you about some of, some of the ideas that we have. What Bobby does is very exciting. He'll tell you some more about what he has in mind for bringing NASA to the next level of technology readiness to achieve the big things we have in mind. As we increase our capabilities, we'll apply them to many different types of missions and move on to the next challenge incrementally. We need to get started on a lot of these technologies today, and we will. Over the next decade, innovative technology investments are required to bring future missions, such as exploration of near-Earth objects, the Moon, and Mars within our reach. These transformative technologies will reduce the cost and risk of future missions. Similarly, Technology needs abound in deep space exploration, astrophysics, aeronautics, and earth science. In each case, NASA technology investment is critical. For without such an investment, these future missions simply won't occur. Achieving great things also involves taking informed risk. The space program needs to return to our roots of informed and measured risks. Exploration and innovation have always come with risk. In fact, if we don't understand, accept, and even embrace risk, we can't move forward boldly. Landing on Mars will never be a low-risk venture, nor will the development of a telescope capable of detecting Earth-sized planets around other stars, or the flight of a new generation of human-rated space systems. Our nation needs to dream big, and these are precisely the right missions for NASA to pursue. An informed risk-taking strategy commensurate with the agency's goals and expectations is not only acceptable, but also required. How else can we accomplish the grand achievements our nation has come to expect of NASA? At NASA, a goal of the President's innovation strategy is to reposition the aerospace community on the cutting edge pushing the boundaries of the, aer of the aerosciences with the technical rigor our nation expects of its space program. Innovation, education, and technology development will be essential to America's success in the 21st century global marketplace. They will be required for us to reach new destinations in the solar system and are the engines that will create new products and services, new businesses and industries, and high-quality, sustainable jobs while improving the capabilities and lowering the cost of other government and commercial activities. Small businesses have generated 64 percent of net new jobs over the past 15 years, leading the innovation push into the future. NASA's budget calls for increases in the maximum award values to small businesses that propose innovative research and development ideas aligned with NASA's technology needs. NASA will invest $184 million in research and technology development by small businesses next year, money that will directly fuel the number of jobs that small businesses create in America. NASA also will continue to fund prizes and competitions that seek creative solutions to technical problems in aerospace technology, solutions that can immediately transfer into the commercial marketplace. As the President recently pointed out, innovation isn't just how we change our lives, it's how we make a living. Nowhere, in this, nowhere is this more true than at NASA, where America continues to reach for new heights, seek breakthroughs in new technologies, some that we can't even imagine yet. Let me give you just a few examples. Earth science is all about innovation. All of our satellite instruments are more or less one-of-a-kind experiments in seeing in new ways. And the same could be said about our science missions that explore our solar system and look beyond it. The Global Hawk, a gift from the Air, <laughs> a gift from the Air Force, has now been made. That's not a joke. <laughs> they really did. The Global Hawk, a gift from the Air Force, has now been made into a drone for science. Its flight capabilities come from the military, but the way we've been able to zip it around the U.S. in new is new, and the science that it's able to perform, like crisscrossing a hurricane a dozen times or more, has not been possible before. 
How about measuring the changes in ice sheets all over the world with lasers? ISAT did that, and we have a new improved ISAT-2 on the drawing board now at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Then there's gra the GRACE pair of satellites. Who would have thought that we'd be able to learn about our world by precisely measuring small mass changes across the Earth? Already, they've measured declines in the water aquifers under California and Pakistan. This has never been done before. We were deeply saddened by the loss of glory, the GLORY mission last week. My heart goes out on a very personal level to the scientists and engineers who expended so much of their intellectual capital and passion on GLORY over the course of its development. Some of our folk had been with GLORY for 10, even 20 years. The good news is that eventually those people will be actively working on the innovations for that next mission. That's the truth about, that's the thing about innovation. It keeps going. NASA is also innovating our development, acquisition, and program management approaches to ensure continued U.S. leadership in human spaceflight. Our commercial orbital transportation system program, among many milestones, last year helped SpaceX become the first commercial company to launch a capsule, orbit the Earth, and retrieve it intact. SpaceX and Orbital will be the first to carry our space station cargoes to space. But there are many others working on their own systems and also the supporting businesses for commercial space, both cargo and crew transportation. We have taken another major step with the successful commercial cargo and commercial crew development, or CCDEV, efforts during the past year. As we direct resources toward developing these capabilities, we not only create multiple means for access in low Earth orbit, we also spark an engine for long-term job growth. NASA is counting on American industry to come through as they have time and time again for this country. And we're facilitating the success of this emerging sector of the American economy. The CCDEV acquisition strategies include innovative pay-for-performance milestones, a fixed government investment, the use of negotiated service goals instead of detailed design requirements, and a partnership approach that includes private capital investment. Among the current participants are Blue Origin with its launch abort system and Sierra Nevada with its Dream Chaser space vehicle. We have to embrace the innovators who may be able to do things more cheaply and effectively than we can. That can be nimble and entrepreneurial and pass those benefits on to us. New capabilities in commercial space for crew and cargo must, must succeed, and I have every confidence they will. NASA is also putting a, a, in place fresh acquisition and program management approaches, including the way we manage risk, to reduce recurring and operating operations costs in both the multipurpose crew vehicle and the space launch system. It's going to be a challenge to get these systems flying on the timetable that's been laid out for us. This streamlining process is one of the ways we're going to help move these schedules along. And those programs themselves, the new rocket that will allow humans to once again reach beyond low Earth orbit, and the capsule in which they'll travel, require us to think in new ways, create new technologies, and meet the challenges not only of the mission at hand, but the broader needs of our space program across a generation. So our innovations will not always be technical, but will involve new ways of looking at our work. We're going to do what government does well, seed the future, help push things along to the next level, accelerate a market that might otherwise be just too big a nut for industry to crack on its own, drive the development of new technologies to reach those far off destinations in the solar system and to make discoveries in other galaxies. At the end of the day, we're going to accelerate what people think is possible. Speed is the vibrancy of innovation, and inspiration is a constant companion to innovation. How many people entered a STEM career because of Apollo, or because they saw an astronaut doing a spacewalk from a shuttle or the International Space Station, or because Hubble blew them away with an image from another galaxy. Our nation has made great progress through its history by developing innovative solutions to the enormously difficult challenges it has encountered. The grand challenge to build an intercontinental railway 
or to land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth, not only utilized our best talent, but also created new technologies and innovations. These achievements also inspired generations to pursue challenging goals, created new industries, and ultimately improved our country and the world. Similar opportunities are in front of us now. However, we won't get there without being innovative and willing to take risks. Robert F. Kennedy once said, and I quote, only those who dare to fail greatly can ever achieve greatly, unquote. This thought applies to NASA today just as much as it did to the NASA of the 1960s. New York Times journalist and critic Brooks Atkinson once aptly said, I quote, this nation was built by men who took risks, pioneers who were not afraid of the wilderness, businessmen who were not afraid of failure, scientists who were not afraid of the truth, thinkers who were not afraid of progress, dreamers who were not afraid of action, unquote. These are the facets of the larger picture of innovation at NASA. It's about technology, engaging a broad community of innovators, building fresh perspectives and embracing change. We're looking forward to many more years of harnessing the power to lead the world in new ideas and technologies that will make global space enterprise a, re a reality. NASA's up to the challenge. I just hope all of you are. Thank you very much. And I think we're going to do questions. We will, we will try Q&A for a while until they pull me off. How's that? General, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Greg Shuckman. I'm from the University of Central Florida. And I want to thank uh, Bobby yeah. for coming down last week and inspiring a, a whole Folk, uh, a lot of folks, uh, both our students and faculty and, and the suborbital folks that came in. Something, it, when I was thinking about Dr. Hamry's introduction of you, and you saw the grin from ear to ear that he had when he was talking about how inspired he was, you know, seeing John Glenn orbiting the Earth, and, and no, I wasn't there either, but, but I saw the movie. Um, it's a good movie. And, and in your remarks today, and in every remark I've heard you, and almost every administrator before you, talking about how NASA has inspired students and inventors to, to go and reach further and to, to innovate. The one thing that I was puzzled when I looked at the budget was there were two areas that, that suffered a cut. Mm -hmm. Human space operations, obviously, and that's because of what's happening in Kennedy. Um, but the other was education. And it's almost 25% lower than FY10. And I know that NASA is sort of the driver for yeah. STEM ed and inspiring all the people. So it, there seems to be a little bit of a a dichotomy there. The education uh, budget line is interesting because it's not a, it isn't a cut. It's the same. It, it minus a few million dollars. It's the same as it has been for the last few years. What happens in in budgets? Any budgeteers in here or congressional staffers? What happens to NASA all the time is that we always get plussed up, particularly in the education budget. So we. When you go, like our budget is, I think, $138 million for education in the FY12 budget, uh, which, which appears to be a decrease from 180 some odd million. Uh, that extra amount was actually put on top of the 130, 143 that we requested in fiscal year 11, uh, and we never turn it down, but we don't plan on it. And so when we put our budget together, we, we, we tried to be consistent uh, in the in the budget that we put for 2012, so it, it looks like we took a cut, or we decided we were going to spend less on education, and we really didn't. But we can't we can't count on uh, you know a plus up that Congress is going to stick on it. They they all have special programs that they like, and I think everybody in here knows um, whether you've been in an organization where you received a you know you're working with a federal budget or not, the plus ups are not always helpful. Uh, because with them, you know, comes the responsibility of carrying out the program that that plus up was put in to carry out, and and sometimes it's the plus up is insufficient to carry out the program. So, okay. I think there was a question over there. Uh, was there? What was it? That dull? Excuse me. 
Hi, Jeff Ballas, Future on Corporation. Uh, I want to ask how, as an agency or even as a country, we balance the need to accept risk with, particularly in these fiscally um, tight times, the perception that uh, taking risk and failing is seen as a waste. Um, we have to, my, one of my jobs is to help people understand that, uh, that failure is an indication that you did take risks. When I talk to college, when I talk to students from kindergarten through graduate school, uh, I always tell them three things, and Colleen, you will attest to this. I've talked to her graduate students, and I, people say, what would you advise a student? I say three things, study really hard, uh, work really hard so that you become the best at whatever you do, and most importantly, do not be afraid of failure. Uh, we are a people right now who I think are afraid of failure. Um, you know, I, I spent some time yesterday morning before we had an incredibly beautiful landing of Discovery uh, down at the Kennedy Space Center talking to the, the folk in the launch uh, support processing team uh, who actually were the people that did the processing for the Glory spacecraft that we lost last Friday. I mean, they were devastated. You know, I, as I mentioned, some of them have been with that program for two years. Some people have been with it for 10 years. There are some of the scientists who have been thinking about glory and, and working on the con concept for 20 years of their life, a lifetime. Um, they understand risk, and, and, but even they were devastated when things did not work out. Um, we have got to help educate our populace that if we are going to lead the world, uh, we've got to be willing to every once in a while accept that we don't, we don't get where, we're, where we thought we were going. Um, so that's, my, that's one of my jobs is to address the issue of risk and help. I don't want anyone to become comfortable at all, uh, but I do want them to understand that, that just because you failed uh, does not mean that you wasted money or you wasted opportunities or other things. I think you waste opportunities when you're afraid to fail and you, and you won't take risks. Yes. And I'll let you all with the mics. You, you can see them as well as I can, so just take them. Thank you. Uh, that was a very, very inspiring and informative uh, talk. Um, I, my name is Christopher Krauss. I'm from the National Environmental Education Foundation. Um, and I just wanted to bring everyone's attention to, uh, there's an uh, editorial in Science. Uh, I think this is the February 25th issue. And uh, the title is House Cuts to DOE National Labs Would Also Hamstring Industry. Now, it, it lists a couple of examples here. Uh, pharmaceutical companies using X-ray crystallography at uh, Argonne National Lab and also how the petrochemical industry um, uses advanced photon sources. Uh, basically, they use these facilities to do their experiments. And one of the arguments in here is that um, decreases in funding for these national laboratories will shut down the source of experimentation for these industries, possibly even prompting them to uh, outsource their facilities um, overseas. So I'm just curious if maybe you have a couple examples that are similar to these examples that are listed in this editorial in terms Things of... Things that we're going to lose or could lose with yeah. reductions in the budget? Specifically that could affect, in that could affect industries mm -hmm. and their ability to, to compete and stay in the United States. You know, we're actually... the. the because all of this is supposition, mm -hmm. uh, and my job is running the, the space agency and trying to make sure that, that we keep astronauts safe and we live within our budget and, um, and that we, we comply with the essential elements of the 2010 10 budget, uh, it may be foolhardy, but, but I have really not given time to, to think about things that we're going to, that we could lose. Um, you know, it's just, it's too early for me to give up. So. So what we're looking at is ways that we can take the funds that we have. And when we built the 2012 budget, um, we told ourselves, okay, you know, what would be a bad case would be, and Bobby will tell you, we said, what could be a bad case? And a bad case when we, when we built the 2012 budget was that you would have to live, uh, you know, under a 2012 spending level, 2010 spending level. So we sized the, essentially sized the 2012 budget uh, to be a, roughly about what we thought the, you know, the 2010 spending level was. Turns out that's a good case. Um, and so we don't see, with, with, with the exception of some very specific things that weren't in the 2010 uh, appropriations, like space technology, which didn't exist then, or some of the other things, 
we don't see yet areas where we're going to have to take things off the table. Now, we have in the individual directorates, I mean, the responsibility of the, of the associate administrators is to say, okay, if I am forced to reduce something, what are, the, what are the priorities that I want to maintain? And so if you go into any directorate, they would be able to show you a prioritized list of projects and programs. But right now, um, we've not gotten to the point where, where we see that we want to take anything off the table. Can I go back? I just thought of something. I, I can give you an example of where we are looking forward and having to do it. The, um, the, the decadal survey in planetary science uh, just came out Monday. And, um, and what was the top priority for the decadal top two? Um, one was a, a Mars mission that we're flying with um, uh, the European Space Agency. And, and, and a second in priority was a mission called Europa, uh, you know, that goes to the, to the moon Europa that we think is, I mean, just covered in water and has all these geysers and all other kinds of stuff. And I'll stop there because I'll tell you something wrong. Um, but what was evident in the language in the decadal survey and what we are already in the process of doing with our European partners in saying, uh, we have to change the way we do business. We have to de-scope the missions uh, because we cannot do them uh, to the level of complexity uh, that they were originally planned when they were envisioned, say, several years ago. So, so a flagship mission that used to, we used to start out saying we're going to have a flagship mission that's going to cost $3 billion. Uh, we have told ourselves that's a non-starter. So we will fly a flagship mission but it's going to have to, it's, we're going to have to find a way to de-scope it such that it, it comes in as a one, as a, as a billion dollar flagship mission, our, our portion of it. And we're asking our, our European partners to do the same, you know, look for ways that we can both de-scope. Um, and if I can give you an example, may, maybe not an actual example, but, it, but an example would be a mission to Mars that was going to have two rovers. Why? Uh, if you can't, if you can't justify the fact that you absolutely have to have two rovers, uh, then why not go with one? And why not let one of the partners provide the rover and the other partner provide instruments or something else that goes? So you're going to see a lot of that going on. And that's already started happening. So that may be an example. That, and that, it does trickle down into industry because we don't build stuff for the most part. You know, Goddard does, JPL does a little bit. But industry builds most of what we do. And so if we are going to de-scope a mission, it means there's going to be something less for industry to do. But we're all in this together. Yes. Charlie, <coughs> Russ Bardo's Charlie. Yeah, Russ, how you doing? Um, you know, everybody here would say technology is great. We wouldn't want to do technology. But there's some people on the Hill, especially in the Senate side, in the CR of zeroed out technology. What do you do if you're faced with a cut to zero in technology? I was informed this morning that, that the newspaper said it zeroed it, but not in reality. Because it's a, a CR, a continuing resolution, and Bobby helped me here because you, you were in the same meeting I was. Um, things are frequently silent in a CR, and all that means is we didn't change anything. So things that are identical, if, if it didn't specifically say uh, you know, this is to go from that amount to this amount, um, then we have flexibility. And so our understanding is that we have the flexibility to conduct, for the most part, the technology, the space technology uh, initiatives that we want to do, as long as we can go in and, and communicate with, our, with our, our, shared, our stakeholders in the Congress and help them understand why we're putting priority on that. So, so the, the space technology was not zeroed out uh, in the continuing resolution. Uh, they didn't plus it up, and they didn't take anything off. They gave us flexibility to, you know, as long as we satisfied their concerns that we not waste the money, I have the flexibility to, to move money around so we can That's do That's good that. to hear. But now, you know, and again, I, what I will emphasize for everybody is if we don't talk to the stakeholders, if we don't travel to the Hill and, and talk to them, you know, about why we want to do something. The, the, Bobby and I spend most of our time back and forth to, 
you know, to staffers and members and everybody, trying to help them understand why this is a higher priority than that. Uh, and why we're going to do this now. And in my comments, you heard me talk about you are going to see us do incremental programs. Uh, a heavy lift vehicle, we're not going to build a 130 metric ton uh, heavy lift vehicle. We can't. And we continue to negotiate and discuss with the Congress uh, why that is not necessary. Not only is it not wise, it's not necessary for us to build a 130 metric ton heavy lift vehicle right off the bat. By the time we need to go, we're, we're going to Mars, or to an asteroid, then you need a 130 metric ton vehicle. And, and the, because we will allow technology to help us get there, uh, a 130 metric ton vehicle that's going to space and going beyond low Earth orbit in, in uh, 2030, uh, I mean, it may weigh half. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating here, but its weight may be significantly less than what a 130 metric ton vehicle is today because we're using composite tanks we're using uh, smaller components. Um, if you look at shuttle, one of the things that we wanted to do in the space shuttle and we just never got there was go to, uh, instead of hydraulically actuated uh, control surfaces, go to electromechanical actuated control surfaces where you get weight down, you get rid of a lot of the risk of damage to hydraulic lines and the like. We just were never able to get there. But that would have been a huge technological leap in the shuttle program that we think would have reduced long-term cost would have reduced weight, and every every pound you take you take away from the launch vehicle is payload you can take to orbit. So a 130 metric ton vehicle is not a 130 metric ton vehicle of today. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Susan Pierce and I'm retired Lockheed Martin, and I am constantly beat up from people who say that the space station is just a total waste of time and money, and we haven't done anything there that's worth anything. Could you name what you think are the, the most significant discoveries or innovations that have come out of the space station? And by the no. way, I haven't heard you mention the word space station. Yeah. I did. I said it a couple of times. Oh, okay. International <laughs> Space Station. I did. <clears throat> um, and I even said that some of the technologies that have come out of the International Space Station or the fact that spacewalks from the International Space Station have inspired people. However, the, the two that I, that I would pr prefer to give right now because they are two that are the closest to actually changing life here on Earth. One is a salmonella vaccine uh, that is coming about by, um, um, Julie, you may help me here. It, the company is, it, it's a company out of Arizona. Estrogen, is that it? Okay, I, I'll let you say that. That's right, Bobby. Uh, that took some salmonella bacteria to orbit uh, and what they found, uh, it was a theory, and what they found was that it becomes incredibly virulent. In fact, it gets really bad. It grows incredibly fast. Uh, when they found that out, they were able to extract a gene in the salmonella bacteria that, that grew radically on orbit that they now will use as the basis for a salmonella vaccine, potentially. And they are now ready to enter human trials. Uh, using that same... Uh, biomedical technology, they're looking at a potential vaccine against um, MRSA, which is the, you know, the hospital in infections, the microimmune, the, the, the bacteria in hospitals that gets immune to antibiotics and stuff. So those are just two examples. A and they came about uh, because of experimentation on the International Space Station. Yeah, you got another example? No. I do actually ask huh? if you may, if I may. Yeah. There is, a, uh, there is a system on board the space station which exists on Earth but is not use, utilized the way it is on the space station. It's called the Wastewater Recycling System. That's right. And it stands for exactly what you think. Uh, we do process our wastewater, human generated and otherwise, and we then retransform that into drinking water. And for having tasted it, water tastes like water. H2 is H2O wherever you are. It is the first time that we're using a system like that on a daily basis. And who knows where in the world this kind of system is going to be extremely useful in the decades to come. Thanks very much, Julia. Do you have time for one Yeah, more? I sure do. That'd be great. I'm, I'm with you. One more? I didn't keep you here all day. I'm going to stop here. Uh, real quick question for you is looking forward at uh, the possibility of commercial crew or cargo transport to the station is given the uh, supply demands of the station is that pr 
probably won't be possible to support five or six you know, vibrant competitors, and you'll have sort of a very limited number of companies that can successfully compete with that level of demand. Uh, going forward, as, as you're sort of looking towards this uh, space station in the latter half of the decade, and concerns about allowing those companies to keep operating in a viable way, uh, there might be a temptation to, for instance, switch more cargo delivery to commercial providers. Would that uh, have the uh, consequence of sort of freezing out uh, European and Japanese uh, cargo deliveries to the station? We can't, um, we, let me give you this example. The, and I am told that um, when we take the final payload to uh, the International Space Station with STS-135, it will have 14 uh, vehicles worth of cargo on board, whether it's in volume or mass or anything else. So, you know, we're a long, long way from being able to replace shuttle as a transporter of cargo to and from the International Space Station. We can't, we could use many, many more providers uh, for cargo. Cargo is, is not a problem. Um, you know, the, the issue will become commercial crew um, and one of the reasons that, that we have to facilitate the success of the commercial crew industry as rapidly as we can is because the International Space Station may go away, you know, in, in 2020. Uh, we will cert probably end up certifying it to 2028. My plea to the commercial industry is for people to, to stop thinking, when they think about commercial space, stop thinking about launch vehicles. Everybody always thinks about launch vehicles. We need destinations. So you need, you need an, an on-orbit infrastructure to which the launch vehicle providers can go. And you're absolutely right. The government cannot sustain uh, four, five, six launch providers. Um, we're looking to have maybe two uh, when you talk about commercial crew. It is up to the industry then, once we as the anchor tenant uh, facilitate their success, it's up to them to decide that they want to create, they want to enlarge the infrastructure. I, I'll take you back to the, and, and I'll keep I'll it short. I'll, I'll take you back to 1972. Uh, I wasn't with NASA, but I was there, um, you know, when I heard about the space transportation system. And it was briefed to then President Richard Nixon. And uh, is Dr. Hamry, he, he probably wasn't there either but he will know even more precisely than I do, and Colleen's probably studied this, so she can tell me whether I'm wrong. But I am told that in 1972, when, um, um, when the NASA administrator and deputy administrator went in and briefed President Nixon on the space transportation system, the concept, it was gonna be a three-pronged system, uh, a launch vehicle, a space shuttle, that would be used to provide routine access to space, uh, at least one, uh, station, uh, space station, that then its intent was to be the way station where we would fly smaller payloads, composite components of a deep space exploration system. We would fly it to the space station, assemble it on orbit, and then go back to the moon, go to Mars, go to other planets, do all the kinds of stuff you wanted. And because you would also want to move from one, spa from one space station to the other as, they, as more would develop, then the third component was an orbital maneuvering vehicle or a, or, um, I think it may have been called an orbital transfer vehicle. So it was a three-pronged system. President uh, Nixon was just excited, said, that's what I want to do. And then as the story goes, and it's probably, this is probably myth, the next day the NASA administrator got a call and said what the president really meant was, this is the amount of money you get. Uh, and the rest is history. And so, you know, NASA was stuck with, okay, how do we do this? How do we prioritize? Well, what would you pick? Y you don't have a, uh, an STS, a space transportation system, and, and for many of you didn't know that that's what it used to be called. It, it was not always the shuttle transportation system. Uh, I think it was after the Challenger accident that we, we moved away from space transportation system as NASA decided we just cannot afford an, an orbital maneuvering vehicle. We're going to get a space station, but, that, but the system that was briefed to President Nixon in 72 is just not going to materialize right now. So we're just going to call it what it is. It's a shuttle transportation system. Uh, but that was where we were in the 70s. Um, that was a vision that, that had good basis for it. 
uh, good sound. I mean, people had done their, their business models and everything, and it had a very sound basis. Here we are back again with another opportunity to do that. And the nation can decide um, how to do it smartly and do it incrementally uh, and say we're going to do it incrementally right off the bat uh, so we stand a chance of success and we not do like we did in 1972 when we were going to build this system all at one time, which was an impossibility. You heard me use three terms, affordable, sustainable, and realistic. Affordable, it, we argue about what affordability means around NASA headquarters all the time. It means, it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. To me, it means it's got to fit within the budget, plain and simple. If the budget says I have this amount of money, I can't spend any more than that amount of money, and I can't count on somebody coming in and giving me a plus up, okay? So I've got a plan to the budget. Sustainable means it's got to last more than one administration, more than one Congress, uh, you know, more than one budget cycle. And it, in order for it to be sustainable, I need destinations, I need uh, infrastructure, all this other kind of stuff. And I have to have it cost uh, low enough life cycle cost that I can show how I'm going to pay for it from beginning to end. Uh, I can't do like we have always done things. The Marine Corps and NASA. I'm a Marine. I think most of you know that. In the Marine Corps, if I can get something started, then in my mind, it's sustainable. Uh, I just got to get it started, and then I can sustain it. Uh, I think NASA's historical mentality was if we can get something started, we can sustain it. You know, the Congress will come to our rescue. The American people will come to our rescue. I have said we're going to do something that's affordable, sustain, truly sustainable, and realistic. Um, if it doesn't pass the sniff test for realism, then we're not even going to undertake that. So that's kind of where we are. And I, I really appreciate the time you've given me and um, uh, look forward to having an opportunity to come back and talk again. I'm looking forward to the panel, so I'll, I'll step aside. Thank you. Can I ask the panel members to come on up and we can move to phase two of this? I'll start introducing them while they're heading up here. And uh, Robert Braun, uh, Chief Technologist at NASA, long experience in the state, uh, space community. I'm sorry, I won't even list all the programs. It's practically everyone you'd know. George Institute of Technology and now uh, back at NASA. So uh, a true expert in this stuff. Chris Kane, uh, formerly of IBM, now of Mercator 21, a uh, professional corporation that works on innovation. He's one of the innovation gurus in Washington. You probably don't know that, but he's been working this for a long time, mainly at IBM. And then finally, Ty Taylor, Capital Advisors on Technology, where he's the president. Again, long experience with space, long experience with NASA, um, long experience with innovation, and a leader in the innovation field. So what I've asked is that our three panelists each take 10, 15 minutes or so to make a few remarks on the themes that the administrators laid out, and then we'll have time for a few questions. So, Bobby, do you want to start? Sure. Cool. Here. Want to come up? I mean, no, no, this is fine. Right. Much more comfortable. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me and for including me in this event. Uh, it's great to, uh, to see so many people here interested in technology. Uh, and an innovation. Um, just real quick about me, um, I'm an engineer. I've always been an engineer. I uh, started my career at NASA wanting to build things, wanted, wanting to build systems that would actually fly to Mars. Uh, I worked uh, in some aspects of planning our human exploration program, uh, plans to one day send humans to Mars, uh, and I spent most of my time working in the robotic exploration program, actually building uh, systems that landed on Mars. Uh, after about 15 years with NASA, I, I left and uh, went to Georgia Tech, where I'm uh, on the faculty. Uh, I'm a professor in the School of Aerospace Engineering. Um, and I, you know, I went there really just to be honest because I love working with students. Uh, and I, and uh, I don't know if you've been on a college campus lately, but there are students all around this country uh, interested in science and technology and innovation and engineering. And the, most, the greatest thing to me about these students is that they, they go into these fields, you know, not for the money. You, know, you ask any of them. Uh, they go into these fields because they want to change the world. They want to invent technology. They want to build the future. And what, uh, what the administrator, what General Bolden just spoke about, was a way that NASA uh, can build the future. Um, and so 
Uh, about a year ago, he asked me to come back to NASA and serve in this chief technologist role. Uh, you may be surprised to know uh, that it's been about a decade since NASA had a chief technologist. Uh, so I, I more than happily came back. Um, uh, NASA is a fantastic place. Uh, it's always been uh, part of my family, actually, to be a part of NASA. Uh, there are innovators all in and throughout NASA, at the NASA centers, uh, in the small businesses that, that work with the agency, at the nation's universities, uh, in large companies. Um, it's a tremendously talented place, and it's a pleasure uh, to work with, the, with people at NASA and in the larger community and to get, get to represent the agency in this way. Uh, when I think of NASA, uh, I think of three long-standing core competencies that make the agency uh, somewhat a special and, and unique place in the federal government. Uh, and these core competencies go all the way back to the Space Act and the founding of the agency. Uh, and they are uh, a focus on research and technology, uh, focus on flight systems, building spacecraft, building hardware, and mission operations. And if you think about NASA, whether you think about the human exploration program or the science enterprise or in, uh, what we do in aeronautics, it's really the integration of those three, th three things, those three core competencies that makes NASA a unique place. In my view, uh, over the past decade, the research and technology side of NASA has been a little bit down. Uh, NASA was rather focused on the near term, uh, on the very next set of missions. And so what I've been doing uh, over this past year is, is trying to reinvigorate that research and technology uh, focus, that those, the research and technology people that are all throughout the agency. Uh, now, by the way, when I talk about these three core competencies, I don't really expect the budget to be divided into three equal pieces. Uh, research and technology, I think, will always be the smallest slice of NASA. It probably always should be. Uh, you know, make no, no uncertainty about that. But it, it does have to exist. There does ha the budget for research and technology at NASA does have to be large enough that there's a critical mass of activity, that there are enough people thinking about the next set of missions, uh, as well as the people thinking about, you know, the very next mission. Uh, as NASA's chief technologist, I get to think about the future all the time. Um, and I'll tell you, NASA has a very bright future. Uh, NASA's future in science, aeronautics, and in human exploration is bright. The missions of the next decade or two are grand in scope. They're bold in stature. And NASA is an agency that can accomplish these missions, uh, many of the missions that General Bolden spoke of. But we'll only be able to accomplish these missions, the missions of tomorrow, if we make the right investments in technology today. And that's, you know, to be honest, that's the pleasure that I get to have, me and a, a small group of people here in Washington and spread out across the NASA centers. We get to think about tomorrow and think about making those right set of technology investments. And we're going to do that by engaging innovators all over the country. Uh, this nation is not short on innovation. <laughs> this nation is not short on innovators. We just need to invest in them. They're at the NASA centers. They're at universities. They're at small businesses. Uh, the engineers and scientists in this country are a very talented group. Uh, and, and NASA is one area of the federal government where we can engage them, where we can make these investments. Uh, by focusing a small portion of NASA on research and technology, we're investing in NASA's future missions. But just as importantly, we're building the nation's economic competitiveness. Uh, we're inspiring young people to continue to go into educational and career paths in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We're building on our nation's global leadership position, our position as a technology leader, and all of the benefits that come from that, whether they be national security uh, or our standing in the, in the global world. Uh, in fact, when I, you know, many people talk to me about the 1960s as the golden age of NASA. Uh, I don't buy it. I'm sorry. I, I wasn't there. 
So maybe that's why I don't buy it. I, I've only witnessed it in black and white, right? Um, I, w I was alive, I should point out, but, but I, wasn't, I wasn't, other than watching on TV, I wasn't that engaged. Um, the reason I don't buy it, the, the reason that I don't buy, you know, that NASA, that, that these are tough times and so we can't make these investments for the future because we have to worry about today, is because they didn't do that in the 60s. You know, when, when, we were building, when we were building and flying Mercury, they were developing Gemini. And when they were building and flying Gemini, they were, they were designing Apollo. And all throughout the Apollo program, we were making investments in technology. Something like 10% of NASA's budget in the 60s was focused on space technology. Over time, those investments have shrunk. Um, and I do think it's vital for the agency, for an agency that's focused on the future, for an agency that the American public expects to be bold and to be dreaming of the future, I do think it's vital that NASA make those small set of investments today to enable our future missions. Uh, and so that's, that's really what my office is all about. That's what we're focused on. Uh, I should point out that uh, it's not just my office. Uh, it's at, this is an emphasis across the agency. I, I do work with all the NASA mission directorates in this. There are technology investments being made in the Science Mission Directorate. There are technology investments being made in aeronautics and certainly in human exploration. Uh, we plan to fully utilize uh, the International Space Station, both as a scientific laboratory, but also as a national lab where we can prove the technologies required to go out beyond low Earth orbit um, and, and go after some of the missions that General Bolden described. Uh, so. With that, um, I guess you can probably understand why I'm excited about this position and uh, more importantly excited about uh, what I believe is a, a bright future uh, for NASA uh, and for this country uh, in aerospace technology. I'll pass it on. Thank Great. You. Thank you, Chris. Do you want to go? It was nice to hear somebody who wasn't looking in the rearview mirror, I have to say. So uh, <laughs> go ahead, Chris. <laughs> I guess fortunately or unfortunately, I was there in the 60s, and I do remember it, and <laughs> not just on television. So I'm glad that you're, you've succeeded us, though. It's, uh, um, it's a privilege, actually, to be here this afternoon and to be um, participating in such a great program. And General Bolden, your, your remarks were great, and I want to uh, support uh, probably just about everything you said, just about. Um, I think it's – I look at this from a – a marketplace perspective about innovation, and that's what I bring to the table after 30 years coming from the marketplace, the global marketplace. Most of it's spent in the technology sector of the marketplace. Um, and I guess what, what I'd like to just start with, uh, Jim, is to say, look, there is a worldwide competition for innovation taking place today. Uh, not necessarily the same environment that took place in the 1960s, where we had a much more bipolar world, okay? Um, NASA no longer is alone or uh, just in a one-on-one -on -one competition. NASA now is competing with many countries for this worldwide competition for innovation. That should be good for us. We have probably the strongest hand to play uh, if we know how to nurture and invest in that hand, which is some of the things that the general was referring to. And when Jim asked me to participate in this, he said, I'd like you to you know, think about what is government's role in enabling innovation and spurring innovation for both um, our country's benefit, but also our society's benefit as well. Um, so I, I think what I'm about to uh, give you are a couple of thoughts about, from my perspective, the marketplace perspective, this worldwide competition for innovation, government's role in a 21st century innovation marketplace. I, I want to highlight two. One is it's important for government, and I, when I say government, I'm talking about the U.S. government, talking about both branches of the U.S. government, legislative and the executive, because the executive has to design its budgets and propose it, and the legislative branch has to validate, approve, and fund those budgets. Uh, one can't operate, nor will it operate without the other. Um, our government has to create the conditions for attracting worldwide investment. And this probably has to be the most important priority, in my opinion, for the United States in today's world creating the conditions for attracting worldwide investment. We, we should be the best in the world at making policy decisions comparatively. 
which means we have to understand who's competing with us, what they're doing, and if we're going to attract investment, we have to have an offering that supersedes anybody else's offering if we want to have the resources, the momentum, the energy, the inspiration, the capacity to win in this worldwide competition for innovation. Now, what do I mean by that? Think and act comparatively, all right? My proposition is we should be benchmarking everything we're thinking about doing, how much to invest in NASA, how much to spend at the national labs, whatever it might be, whatever our tax policy, we should be benchmarking that against the G20 nations. It's 85 percent of the worldwide economy in today's environment, and it, and it comprises both our closest allies and our, our strongest competitors. So if we're not making policy decisions in a comparative way, benchmarking ourselves against 85 percent of the global economy, which creates a community of both allies and competitors for us to be mindful of, I think our decision-making process and our, our fiscal and um, uh, public policy uh, is misguided. I don't think we do that very well in Washington. I've been in Washington for 30, over 30 years. I think we have uh, you know, rightly been proud of being the largest economy in the world for a long time, number of decades, being the most successful economy in the world and country in the world. The game has changed. We have to think about making decisions in a comparative way, benchmarked against the practicalities and the realities of what's happening around the world. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, unfortunately, um, well, one, the first one's a negative example. Uh, the President, to his credit, uh, proposed in his budget in his State of the Union address making the R&D tax credit permanent and, uh, and making it more robust. Okay, that's a good thing to do, I guess, if you're going to be the best in the world or if you're going to be number one, two, or three. But why to enhance and to make permanent something that's mediocre is beyond me. That's not playing to win. And at best, we will go our R&D tax credit, which was the first in the world in 1981, under the President's proposal, will go from being number 17th in the world to number 13 in the world. I find that unacceptable for a country who has the ability and the desire to be the best. It's an example of a public policy decision and strategy that will only kick the can down the road and continue a lack of exceptional performance. And it goes back to attracting investment, worldwide investment, in a worldwide competition for innovation. Uh, we have to have to have the same orientation toward government R&D programs. Right? And I th we have to make choices, absolutely. You can't win without making choices. But we ought to compare what we're betting on in our government R&D programs against what the other G20 countries are putting their money into. And this is, I think, the International Space Station is a good example of where we have an idea, we've created a set of partners, and we've chosen to pursue that strategy. That well, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, we recently did a study at Mercator 21 uh, about the investment criteria that, that uh, uh, large uh, corporate decision makers make about where to place their investments in the world today. And um, we meshed that and analyzed that against what countries are offering against six different criteria. Uh, in some of those six criteria, the United States, well, actually, in the six criteria, the United States only came out number one in one, the availability of skilled talent. But it's also diminishing in a comparative sense. In every other, in one other category, we're at the bottom. In every other category, we were average. Now, the world has many players. That's okay to be not number one in every category, but it's not a winning strategy to be average overall when you're competing in a world of intense competition, especially that is a competition grounded in innovation. Um, one piece of good news, which was when the Competes Act was reauthorized, um, there was an amendment adopted into it from Senator Warner, which creates an obligation by the Commerce Department to do an annual study to the Congress about the relative standing of the United States from a competitiveness a strategy perspective with other countries. Good thing to do. The beginning a beginning step for comparative policy making. The problem was that the countries that were selected are not the competitors that we're dealing with in the 21st century. They're the competitors we were dealing with in the 19th century. So we have a few technical amendments probably that needed, are needed here, 
but if it said, let's look at the community of nations that make up 85 percent of the worldwide economy, let's say the G20, it'd be a lot more valuable thing to do than comparing us with the industrial manufacturing economies that we used to compete with. So creating the conditions for um, attracting worldwide investment. The, the, last, the next point is uh, helping companies and entrepreneurs scale. Uh, markets are global today, they're integrated today, they're instantaneous, they're digital and physical, and one of the major roles that government can do is to help our companies and our entrepreneurs scale to meet that playing field. Um, growth resides outside the G7 countries, by and large. Uh, there's been a reallocation of economic assets that's taken place in the last 20 years, dramatically. It was taking place before that. And we need to help our companies and our entrepreneurs access that growth, which resides outside the traditional markets that we're comfortable with. That is both a digital and a physical statement, um, and is one of the tremendous opportunities, I think, and benefits the government can provide. Uh, number two would be focus equally. Uh, the general talked about disruptive technologies. Absolutely. Uh, NASA is a great example of an incubator for disruptive technologies. But we need to focus equally on disruptive technologies and disruptive business models. And in fact, I, uh, I would argue that disruptive business models are frequently more important and more wealth generating than disruptive technologies. And uh, they don't, a disruptive business model can change the world and it doesn't have to use a disruptive technology to do so. Think about the, some easy examples, CNN, very disruptive business model, not necessarily disruptive technology. The iPod, very disruptive business model no disruptive technology, okay? There's a small company that's about to turn the advertising industry on its head. It's called Personal. Your personal information is, using a metaphor, the currency of the 21st century digital world. Shouldn't you be giving access to that information to others versus others just taking access to it? Potentially very disruptive business model. Uh, two quick things, service sector, as important, if not more, than the manufacturing and the agricultural sector, both on G for the United States GDP as well as uh, employment. Government can focus on innovative breakthroughs in the service sector. And last, securing the global technology supply chains. And here I give great uh, kudos to NASA. They're part of an organization called the Trusted Technology Forum, public-private sector partnership that's designed to focus on leading edge best practices to, sh to secure global technology supply chains. And in the hybrid infrastructure that we have today, of a digital and a physical infrastructure, nothing can be more important and it can be tremendously leveraging to have a secure global technology supply chain that American companies and American entrepreneurs can use to reach that growth that is in those new areas of the world that's instantaneous. Well, hello everyone. I, uh, I too am ex extremely excited and grateful for being here. Uh, not only am I a native Washingtonian, born and raised here, uh, but I am also a former NASAite, uh, as is my mother, uh, who I, I didn't tell her about today's f form, because I was afraid she'd be in the back going, that's my son! <laughs> I didn't want to do that. Uh, and, and in fact, I was so thrilled. I am not an engineer. I, I, I came out of college. Uh, in fact, I began my career with NASA as a cooperative education student and uh, began my career uh, in the uh, comptroller's office. And the, the beauty of doing that is it's all about the money. And regardless of how dumb you may be, as long as you keep asking those questions until they're, they're answered, you don't give away the dollars. Okay? So they have to deal with you and you get smarter and smarter as part of the process. Um, I, I have to tell you, Chuck Westner was going to try and be here. I'm stepping in for him. I, I, I'm a member of the National Academy of Sciences. I support Chuck on a number of various committees uh, that I'll mention here in a moment. Uh, Chuck, for some reason, or other, elected to be in Brussels uh, uh, today rather than here, but I, I cannot imagine why. But I am, I am indebted to him, as I am actually to NASA, for a, a wonderful career because much of what I've learned and applied in the private sector, quite frankly, I learned at NASA. And, and the essence of that is the can-do approach. You can do it, okay? I, I, I have to tell you, I, I, would, I, I apologize to the gentleman who, who made the opening remarks to introduce General Bolden. Um, the spirit, uh, if you will, the excitement that's been alluded to that is somewhat, uh, one would argue, is somewhat missing today. Um, 
you know, I have been around the country, and sometimes when the shuttle is up in the air and it, and it lands, it's not on the front page like it used to be. Okay? It's in the metro section. And I go, what happened? You know, my kids promised they would never work for NASA because I'd come home every day and say, guess what NASA did for you? You know, see that light bulb? That's NASA technology. You see this over here? That's NASA technology. And all I was doing, and in fact, I even bought the little astronaut suits for them. Okay, it's birthday. <laughs> they run around. I've got the pictures of all that. But I was, I was really thrilled. Uh, having worked on the space station program and been part of the headquarters team, uh, when the president said, go do it, it was a reincarnation. Uh, not quite the same. I wasn't there for the Apollo era. Uh, I had a chance to work with some of the people, some of the leaders uh, of that time. But I have to tell you, it was, it was quite exciting. Uh, and I'm sure I drove my, uh, my family and friends crazy about my enthusiasm about, the, about NASA. Uh, but I am also convinced that in spite of the many financial challenges or economic challenges we have today, that uh, with the leadership here of General Bolden and, and Bobby and others, that we can get back there. We can get back there because I've taken a pretty hard look at your roles and responsibilities, and you've got, you've got, a, you've got a big ticket there. But uh, it doesn't mean it can't be done. What I thought I'd do very quickly is try and reinforce some of the comments that have been made. Uh, from an academy perspective, uh, benchmarking is very important to us. Uh, you know, taking a look at how things are done both here and abroad, and quite frankly, that's what Chuck is doing in Brussels. He's taking a look at their innovation system. Uh, one of the things that we've done over the last year or so is looked at a number of activities, looking at clusters, looking at uh, the need for photovoltaics, solar, solar pal panels, energy-related kinds of things who's kind of doing the right thing and trying to document the best practices. All of this is important and relative to NASA. <laughs> One of the key, uh, I don't know if you remember uh, Dr. Uh, Mary Good, she used to be the Undersecretary for Technology uh, during the Clinton administration. As, as we all know, there's no longer a technology administration. But Mary chairs an uh, a, a committee that I happen to be a member of called the State and Regional Innovation Practices. And it's important because we're going around the country looking at those areas where we find that from a regional perspective, the states are actually making investments, significant investments, and I'm going to point out New York, Ohio, where you have high unemployment rates. New York is making investments in nanotechnology, Ohio is making investments in the manufacturing community, and they are making those investments to do exactly what you alluded to, to draw additional capital, and, to, and as Bobby alluded to earlier, to create high-paying jobs. And in the case of New York, uh, where they're making tech, uh, those investments in the nanotechnology arena, they are in fact, they've put $2 billion in and they've been able to raise $10 billion worth of capital, private investment. In addition to that, they've got a $4 or $5 million plant being built out, outside of Albany. In addition to that, that's going to create about 1,500 jobs over the next five years. And those are very great jobs, uh, good jobs, as opposed to uh, some of the ones that are, you know, driven by the service, the service sector. NASA, in my mind, uh, continues to have a role. It always did. It, you know, if you, if you go back and you look at its creation, many of you know, those of you that have been along, around long enough knows, its job, the reason we have so many of our technology in the marketplace is because uh, our mission was to, you know, disseminate to the widest practical, practicable extent our information. Now, could we, could we have done it better back then? Probably. Can we do it better now? Yep. Yep. Because the taxpayers and the nation needs for us to do, basically do more with less. That's really what this is all about. When you peel back the onion, you, you, you stop getting so excited about the technology, and you look at what really needs to be done, and those, and those organizations or states that are having some success, collaborate. this is not the first time we've said we need to collaborate. This is not the first time we've said we need to partner. What we're talking about is degrees of partnership, degrees of collaboration. We need to take it to a level we've never been before. Because generally speaking, if the R&D budget remains at roughly 2.5% of the GDP, which it has over some period of time, history says it ain't going to get much bigger. So how do we continue to innovate, create that atmosphere, that structure, and leverage the best minds that we have? And I don't think there's any question about it that historically, we, you know, we are number one. I'm an aging jock. As I tell my, my daughter, my uh, trash talking ability far exceeds my ability to play basketball at this stage of my life. But I will trash talk you to death, and I don't like to lose, okay? And I'm sure NASA doesn't like to lose. 
and I'm sure from a big picture, the nation doesn't like to lose. But you do have companies from a global, I'm sorry, countries from a global perspective, Japan, France, Germany, Finland, others, that are looking at our best practices, leveraging what we're doing and beginning to do it better than us. So one would say, in the old days, we always talked about industrial policy. You know, we can't pick winners or losers. Well, my gosh, we sure can't sit on our keister either. And so I think the investments that we are making, the investments that NASA is making, the structure that it's put together to try and accelerate the transition of technologies and get the biggest bang for the buck is the right way to go. And again, that's what the, I think our country is, is demanding. So when I, again, when I look at this, it is, is a lot more, it's not as much about technology as it is about the culture. Okay? And is the culture, we as people, going to enable us to be as successful as we have been in the past and go beyond? Okay? Yes, there's training. You know, I think we need to probably mix and match the people, the workforce a little bit more with the people in the private sector, the public sector, and that's what you're getting when you really form these very strategic partnerships. But it's going to take, you know, we talk about sustainability, it's going to take a sustained commitment. It's going to take strong leadership, and it's going to take a sustained commitment. We can't turn the faucet on today and 18 months from now and go, oh, just kidding. You got to be in it for the long haul, even during the tough times. And based on some of the research that we've done from an academy perspective, we think, we think Ohio and New York, New Mexico is beginning to do some things in this regard. They're making investments in very difficult times for the long haul, if that's the right thing to do. So uh, I'm a little biased. Probably if Chuck, would he Chuck were here, he'd say, Ty, you know, you're a NASAite, and you're probably you know, being a little biased in your remarks on behalf of NASA. Let me be the first to say that's right. Okay? because I've never been uh, so proud of a federal agency, quite frankly. Um, I'm a big believer in the public sector. I've been, my wife, although sometimes calls me Mr. Private Sector now, I will add. But I really do believe that we've got it right now. It's about execution, okay? So let me just stop there and, and, and we'll go to Q&A. Thank, Thank you. Uh, great remarks by all three panelists. I'm gonna take the moderator's privilege and ask the first question, which is, uh, the general mentioned uh, JPL and companies building things and how important that was. So I want to ask you, you know, one of the topics we hear about today is the decline in manufacturing capabilities in the U.S. How important is it to actually make things to be innovative? Where does manufacturing fit into innovation? Um, what would you say about that? And clearly for Ma NASA, making things is, is kind of crucial to what you do, you know? So you want to just go down the road? Sure, sure. Um, so I think the last part of your question is actually the answer. Um, for NASA, um, it's not enough just to have a great idea and play in the sandbox. For NASA, we want to build something. For us, manufacturing is an integral part of what we do. Uh, we're talking about new flight systems. We're talking about operating these systems in the harsh environment of space. So it's a, it's a coupled problem. Uh, now, when you, when you get into manufacturing itself, there's the manufacturing of a technology, and there are the uh, process improvements, business practice improvements for the manufacturing sector themselves, and we're interested in both of those. Uh, so just, just for example, uh, NASA has developed some pretty impressive uh, analysis tools that we use for process flow of the space shuttle uh, down in Florida or for assembly of the International Space Station. These are computer models, computer analysis tools that we want to make available to the manufacturing industry uh, in this country uh, so that they can use those same type of models uh, for efficiency improvements uh, across a wide range of sectors. That's something that will affect NASA and improve NASA's future products, but it's also something that will affect us, you know, across the United States. Chris, did you want to Critical. It's, it's critical to, in order to be competitive, to manufacture something. Um, but I think what we've done over the years is focused so much on the manufacturing piece, almost in isolation of what extends the economic, the high economic leverage of, the ma of manufacturing. Um, in today's world where manufacturing is getting increasingly computerized, automated, um, employing fewer people, in order to keep that going, you have to have a high-skilled workforce that 
should be the best at manufacturing services expertise. And we don't really talk a lot about manufacturing services. And that's where the premiums are. That's where in the marketplace today you get companies make a lot more money off of their ability to support the $4 billion nanotechnology um, uh, fab in Albany through services than they do by running the fab because the fab is going to be pretty automated. Right? And there'll maybe be 600 people in the fab running the in the kind of a classic manufacturing sense. Yet it, around it is a hugely leverageable ecosystem of talent and services, and we don't really think about that very much. So manufacturing is critical, but to extend its economic, high economic leverage, it is the ecosystem, and, and what I would point to is the services that come from that. Um, so. Can't argue with its importance. Um, it's been part and parcel of our nation's growth in terms of the manufacturing sector. Uh, I think you're right, Chris. That's a good point about about the premium. Uh, there are only going to be so many high tech jobs working on the floor, okay, in the facility itself. Um, but I also think, from a park or from a regional cluster perspective, there's an opportunity. You know, we all know there are X number of NASA centers that have various capabilities, and I think uh, there's an effort, be it manufacturing or be it anything else, for NASA to, to strengthen its relationships at the state and local level to enable it again to, to capitalize on the knowledge base, to capitalize on the experience and leverage those dollars. But manufacturing is, is key, no doubt about it. Uh, thank you for your presentations. My name is William Ben, and I'm an energy lawyer in Washington, D.C. with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And I'd like to ask you a question about the innovation process and management of the innovation process. Uh, if you were going to put together a team that is to become a high-performing, innovative team, what kind of people would you want on the team? And then secondly, if you were going to invest a lot of money in a team over a long period of time or a company, over a long period of time, what kinds of things would you want to know about the way in which the company managed the innovation process in order for you to invest money in that company over a long period of time? So let's talk about people. Um, I would want people who have skills that look like that, a T right on the top deep down to some subject matter expertise that uh, makes them truly differentiated leaders. Uh, in many organizations, we have people cobbled together who just look like that, an I. And in today's collaborative, interconnected world, uh, it is more important than ever to team and to leverage the knowledge, insights, and experiences of your colleagues because you can do it 24 hours a day instantaneously. And the people who have the best organizational models and the best leadership teams are doing that. And the ones who are slow to respond and reacting to the marketplace or to other developments are still stuck in a more industrial era uh, siloed um, collection. If I can uh, just add to that for a second, uh, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, I would also want a diverse team. Um, I would want a, a mix of young people who are energetic, energetic, passionate, dedicated, who actually don't know how hard the job is. They don't know that it's impossible. <laughs> and I would want them to be mixed with some scarred old timers, basically. Uh, that, people that have the experience in doing something like we're now trying to do in an innovative way. So they have some of the lessons learned and they have some of the experience. And what, you, what we're doing actually at NASA right now are, is trying to put together teams just like that. We have a lot of people at NASA that have uh, years of experience, uh, whether it's in human spaceflight uh, or in other parts of the agency, and that experience is incredibly valuable. And we have young people, perhaps in our nation's universities or in small businesses, in some of the commercial uh, companies that uh, Administrator Bolden referred to. And we're, we're really trying to match those folks up. Uh, in a team environment. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, let me jump in there. Let me answer that from this perspective. I actually uh, have had the pleasure the last five or six years to run a entrepreneurial uh, summer institute where we train entrepreneurs, and, and, and the students, by the way, are from 20, 19, 20 year olds to 50 somethings. And the one thing that we, we emphasize is, and from an academic perspective, we want everyone. We just don't want the engineers. We just don't want the chemists, the scientists, et cetera, et cetera. We want a little bit of everyone because when we mix them all up, the power of, of, the, of, of what they can do is tremendous. One of the things that we give them is patented technologies, and we ask them and we challenge them to come up with a secondary application of that technology. And we actually give them NASA technologies that are as part of that portfolio. And it is amazing when you mix the gray hair with the young, to make your point, uh, what, what you get, and, they're in a, and they have to function as a team. It is so critical. It's not about me. It's about the team. It's the overall objective. So again, a diverse, a diverse uh, cadre of people would be very important. The, the other thing is, you know, I, if you look at, um, you know, I think of innovation, I also think of technology transfer, which I've spent a fair amount of time working in. And if you look at, some, at the universities that have the most successful commercialization business models, you see that those organizations are typically spinoffs from the university. They are nonprofits that operate outside of the traditional university bureaucracy. And so we talked earlier about risk. We talked earlier about flexibility and being agile. And they, in fact, are able to be more responsive to uh, the business needs. They are, in fact, able to hire and fire more rapidly. Uh, they're able to get the job done uh, more quickly and more effectively. And, and I struggle sometimes recognizing, you know, it, trying to figure out whether or not the existing system, and I say that in a very broad sense, not just to include NASA, does in fact, since we've got these big goals, is our system designed based on the current challenges, both here and abroad, because things have changed over the last 20, 30 years, for us to be able to meet these, these overarching goals? And I just don't know. I, I'm, I'm not, I think, I think maybe, you know, the old DARPA, ARPA, whatever, maybe even a separate organization away from the main, the main organization might be, might be a viable way to go to some extent. Could I add one thing? You asked a second question about how, what companies or what would be your investment criteria in an enterprise or a company? A right. Mm. I would not invest in any company that was not pervasively multilingual. There, there is a prize, by the way, if you stump the panel. So, uh, you know, that was, you almost got it, I got to say. That, uh, any more questions? Because we are coming close to the, the oh, we have, oh, we have two more, I guess. Go ahead. Do you have time for, can you do? Okay, great. Hi, it's uh, Mike Bevan with the Office of Space Commercialization at the Department of Commerce. Um, just had a question about the investment tax credits. Um, uh, I think mentioned earlier on the panel, um, there was a bill last year that was introduced in the Senate that um, talked about investment tax credits for uh, commercial space companies, uh, um, emerging and, and entrepreneurial space companies. Um, just wondered to, if you guys could give us your thoughts on that when, and what you think about those. My assumption is you think that they're good, <laughs> but I know there's a lot of uh, debate, so. Well, at least in my remarks, I was referring to the research and development tax credit, all right. Um, investment tax credits are, you know, uh, in the same family, but not necessarily the same thing. Um, you know, my general experience is that ta tax policy is, is important. It is a differentiator, but it's, infrequently the controlling decision point. Mm. Infrequently. I didn't say never. Um, this work we did that I referred to looked at six criteria that senior level global decision makers use to invest. Uh, tax policy was, tax and financial policy was one of those six. That's a that's a good question. No, 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 no. Well, let me uh, let me take let me take a shot. So, 
That is a that's a very good question. You're close. Uh, so let me let me start Just off. Make something up. No, no, no. No, let me start off by saying that there. Are, first of all, there are many factors that are the same. Okay. So things like uh, that, that you've already heard. Things like uh, the government's role in seeding innovation. Uh, things like the government the government's role in disruptive technology, uh, in R and D investments to spur to spur along uh, private investment and to spur along you know corporate investment and tech transfer and commercialization. Those are important in space as they are in other industries. Uh, I think, you know, for me personally, the primary difference uh, in aerospace on the NASA side of civilian side of aerospace is that NASA does have a plan. NASA has a set of destinations that they want to one day send humans to. We have a, a whole series of decadal surveys in the sciences where we you know, would like to go do some pretty ambitious missions to improve uh, our scientific knowledge, our, under, our understanding of our place uh, in the universe, of the world around us. Um, and so, you know, that, that, that provides a high-level strategy, if you will, uh, for NASA's technology investments. Now, many of those investments are then spun off, uh, and they affect us, they benefit us every day in our lives here on the Earth. Um, many of those investments are spun off and commercialized uh, into companies that are, that, that are quite profitable, uh, into products and services, into high-tech jobs all around this country. And so in that regard, NASA acts, I think, like some of the rest of the government. If I may, and just, you know, the flip side of that is we know what the inhibitors are in some cases. The inhibitors are you only build so many shuttles, okay? You only build so many stations. But, but clearly NASA has a very rich history of those technologies being disseminated into the marketplace. You know, the, the counter to even the inhibitor point is that even if you look at the SBIR community, which just represents a, a small portion of the R&D funding, you will see that many of the companies, and almost I think the number is as high as 80% of those companies that compete for NASA research and development funds through SBIR are also competing with the DOD community. And so you get some leveraging effect there that is also facilitating a greater dissemination of those technologies or those outcomes, if you will, from those investments. 